this evening's effort is to create a square circle. The Rambam's guide is one of the greatest works of philosophy ever produced anywhere by anyone. Everybody agrees to that. Not only did it have a major impact on Jewish thinking, it does to the present day, but it was translated into Latin and it was read in Europe and it had a strong influence on the development of Christian religious thinkers. A couple of years ago, I spent a year going through it with the Chavrusa. Now, of course, it's written in Arabic. So we are at the mercy of translations. And we were working with five different translations. Our assumption was what the Rambam writes has to make sense. So if a certain translation rendered it in such a way that it didn't make sense, we look for another translation, <laughs> see if it made more sense. Obviously, I can't count on the original Arabic. Um, but uh, <coughs> it is a gigantic masterpiece, a gigantic masterpiece. Uh, it doesn't need my saying so. I just, I've been to it a number of times. I wrote a, a philosophical index to the, to the motor, which you can get online. At any rate, um, what I would like to do uh, is just give you a couple of thoughts about the commentant and then take you through the first two chapters as best I can to give you a taste of what the Roman does. I remember when I was in secular high school um, reading history, they had a list of 12 people in the history of the world each of whom mastered everything his culture had to teach. They simply learned everything there was to learn in their culture. And the Rambam was one of them, even recognized by Goyim. Um, his encyclopedic knowledge and his power of, of analysis and his originality to take the entire Torah Shaval Peh and organize it in his own original way, including all the laws that aren't practiced, about which other Rishonim were very uh, sparse. And to paskin them all and to set them up in a brand new format, in addition to writing the Parish of Shnais and, and the more and, uh, and systematic essays on, on important topics, um, and some works on medicine. I mean, and he says you should sleep seven or eight hours a night. I don't know if he took his own advice, but if he did, you know, the fact that he could. Could, could accomplish what he accomplished in his in one lifetime is, is just astonishing. Now, um, the Moran Devuchim is addressed to a particular person, a particular student, and others like him, who studied personally with the Rambam and then had to go away. So he said, I'll fill in with the missing material with, with a book. And the student was not adequately prepared. Why was he not adequately prepared? Because he hadn't studied physics, that is to say, the physics of 900 years ago, because he wasn't adequately trained in natural science, so he wasn't ready to receive the Rambam's teaching. Even so, the Rambam wrote the book for him, but he says the introduction, you're handicapped because you didn't know that. So it's interesting to know that knowing how the physical world works, one point or another, is a prerequisite of getting what the Rambam wants to teach. The first 50 chapters are devoted to someone who's seriously worried about whether or not God has a body. And he goes through all of the terms, the major terms in the Tanakh, which seem to indicate whether that God has a body, and he explains how they should be understood. His methodology is very strict. You can only say a word means X on any occasion if there are some occasions in which the word clearly means X in the text that you are dealing with. The text is the Tanakh. And, for example, a heart is a pump that pumps a liquid to various destinations. You can have a heart made of flesh. You can have a heart made of steel. You can have a heart made of rubber. But you're going to talk about a heart for Kodesh Baruch Hu. So you And you say, oh, well, there, of course, it doesn't mean, phys doesn't mean something physical. You can't just say that. You can't wave your hands and say it's not physical. You have to find a place where the word heart is used for something that's not physical, clearly, and then you can say here, too, it's used for something that's not physical. Otherwise, 
You can't do that. Now there's a poster that talks about Lev HaShemayim, the heart of the heavens, and that's not talking about a pump. There are no pumps in the heavens that pump liquids around. So obviously it means the center, most important, fundamental. And then that can be borrowed for, for other things as well. <coughs> he, at the end of the first book, he has a review of the major streams of Arabic philosophy that existed in his time. And he points out what their goals are and how their arguments work and their serious shortcomings. And he explains how his efforts are going to be different from theirs. He argues for the existence of God on two grounds. Either the world has a beginning or it doesn't. If the world has a beginning, then there has to be something that gave it the beginning, and you get to God quick and easy. But, as he says, the Arabic philosophers thought they could produce a good argument that the world has a beginning, and he said their arguments are weak, and if that's where you stop, you haven't got any more strength for your conclusion than your, the strength of your argument that the world has a beginning, and those arguments are very weak. So he said, I'm going to prove that God exists even if the world has no beginning. Now, of course, if it has no beginning, then we're not talking about a creator. We're talking about a creator. But there is something that's responsible for how it operates and it's, and it's uh, the laws that govern it and how things grow and develop and the way in which it's, uh, it's uh, developing, what it's going to develop into. And that thing, from that point of view, can also be called God. So either way, you get into arguing for God. He says that several times in the, in the motor. He says that's what he was doing in the Mishnah Torah as well. Um, though he's been misunderstood and people said he's an Aristotelian, but he says explicitly he's not an Aristotelian. And he, he rejects Aristotle over and over again. And in some places he says, I'm going to tell you what Aristotle said, I'm going to tell you what's written in the Tanakh, I'll tell you what the Chazal said, so that we can distinguish the parts of Aristotle that are acceptable, because they agree with the Tanakh and the Gemara, <coughs> and the parts of Aristotle have to be rejected because they don't agree with our sources. Very simple. And by the way, I was thrilled to find that the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy which online is a very, very good source for the contemporary positions in philosophy and all across the field. And they have an article on the Rambam. Um, and the art, author of that article, who is a secular philosopher, happens to be Jewish, um, writes that the Rambam was not an Aristotelian. I was very happy to see that. It means that somebody took the care to, to get it right. And he read that the end of the first book is a, a review of it. And the second book, the beginning of the second book is that demonstration. Then he deals with divine providence in great length, going through five different theories that are found in the ancients and in, in the modern philosophers. And he points out what's wrong with them and exactly how the Jewish view works. Um, as uh, as of the book of Job, what's to, what's to be learned from the book of Job. Beginning of the... Third book, he does an analysis of the book of Ezekiel, what's called in, in our literature the account of the chariot. And he writes, uh, I've discovered, he writes this, I don't know what it means. I have no tradition as to what it means. Our traditions on this matter were lost. Exile and persecution caused to lose a great deal of what was part of Jew ancient Jewish wisdom. I've studied it, and I, I think I have an understanding of it. I had no teacher. I could be wrong, he writes. Rum's humility comes out many times in the morning. I could be wrong. But if I just let it die with me, then I will not fulfill my obligation of passing on to others what could be the real teaching. On the other hand, you're not allowed to teach it in, 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 uh, in the open. Mishnah and Chagig and other places say you can't do that. So I'm going to explain the first several chapters of the book of Ezekiel. And you may very well, as you read what I write, think that I'm just saying over what Ezekiel says. I'm just repeating the words that are there in the book. That's right. You might very well think that. That's what I think. I've read it, I don't know, a dozen times. I haven't got a clue what he wants. I haven't got a clue what he's hidden in there. He's hidden something in there. It's too, too, too hidden for me to pick out. He's, the way he did it, he's giving away all the secrets, but only for a person who can penetrate to see that the secrets are there. I'm not one of those people. The second half of the third book is his account, systematic account of the reasons for the commandments. Um, and he goes through a, an encyclopedic review of the commandments. In several places he says, I don't know how this one works. I don't know what the reason for that is. Some places he speculates. He says, I didn't find any sources. I, my guess is that it works this way. And for the vast majority, he has well worked out reasons for the commandments. This is the basic outline of the, 
of the guide, although there are, I've left out uh, quite a number of things. Now, uh, the Ram is very careful about language, very careful about Tanakh, very careful about what counts as an interpretation, what doesn't, the difference between the prophets and the books of Moses, uh, and he has well-articulated principles for us. Throughout, he has scattered remarks about science, and many of them are very up-to-date. Uh, the picture that the medievals were full of superstitions and uh, um, um, had no sense of objectivity is simply, I don't know all the other medievals, but the Rambam is certainly wrong. Um, and he, his principles of how to treat, treat science are, in scientific terms are, are there in the text. Now, um, also, a considerable amount of Musr, that means ethical instruction, is present both in the way in which he interprets commandments or the way in which he interprets verses, but also the way in his own methodology, and that's something we're going to see this evening. So, I'm going to take you through the key points for this purpose in the first two chapters of the guide. If you're going to look up the guide in English, uh, there are two standard translations. One is by, by a fellow named Friedlander, who taught at Jews College in London. <coughs> and I think the first edition came out in 1894, and the second edition came out in 1904, 1907. It's free on the, on the net because there's a limit to copyrights. That's the better translation. The more modern one, celebrated from the uh, University of Chicago Press, it came out in the 60s, and written by a professor at the University with a long introduction by Leo Strauss, is much worse. It's much worse. So if you're going to look at it in English, um, you can get this free on that, or it's, or it's, in, it's in print. It's in print in bound, bound fashion. And uh, this is the one that, uh, that, that you should use. The first point he makes in the book is the, the word tselem. The famous verse in Genesis says that God created us in his tselem. Some people are misled to think that the word tselem has something to do with pictures. In fact, the modern Hebrew word for camera is a matzlema, which means a, a machine that makes tselems. And the tselem there is obviously a picture. But that is simply a mistake in the biblical Hebrew. Tselem has no visual connotations. You will not find a single verse in the entire Tanakh where tselem refers to a picture. Another word that's used in describing how we are related to God is demus. Rambam um, says demus comes with the word domet, which means similar. Similar means sharing any quality whatsoever. It could be an essential quality or a totally inessential quality. He quotes a pasuk from what the Navi says, I am like domet to a pelican in the wilderness. Says the Rambam, the, the prophet does not have feathers, and doesn't stand on one leg, doesn't eat fish, and, you know, doesn't fly with wings. He's lonely. Like a pelican in the wilderness, a solid wilderness, a solid, a solitary and lonely. And then they'll be saying, I'm lonely also. To say that we are we have a dimion, we're doma to God, means there's something we have in common. So that has nothing to do with the physical form. Selah means something essential. Something essential. Something which is crucially important, something which helps define the nature of a thing. But again, it has absolutely no visual connotations. So when it says that God made us bit with his form, it had nothing to do with a visual connotation. The Rambam says that for the human being, Selim is intelligence. Because, now I'm going to put in some words which the Rambam elaborates on, part one, chapter 54, later on in the book. We don't talk about God. We can't understand anything about God. We only have how he relates to us, how he presents himself to us in our world. And the key essential element that he presents in the world is that of an intelligence. So we also have intelligence, and that's not just a dimion, but it is a tselem because it is essential to us, and it is the heart of the image that he projects into the world by which we know him. Or maybe the word image isn't right, the representation that he projects into the world by which we know him. So when it says that God made us in his selim, 
That means that he gave us intelligence. That's basically the part of chapter one that I wanted. Now, chapter two starts as follows. Some years ago, a learned man asked me a question of great importance. In the Hebrew, the Hebrew translation, the word is chacham. The problem and the solution which we gave in our reply deserve the closest attention. Before, however, entering upon this problem and its solution, I must premise just throwing in something you need to know. Now, when the room says something like that, you know, the, the red lights start to light up. I'm just throwing something in? The Roman doesn't just throw anything in. He puts this premise in, it means it's absolutely crucial. And as you'll see, this premise thrown in casually at the beginning is, is necessary to defend himself against an objection, which would otherwise would have crushed his argument. Every Hebrew, that is to say every speaker of the Hebrew language, knows that the term Elohim as a homonym, it has several different meanings. It can refer to God. It can refer to angels. It can refer to the judges and rulers of countries. And Onkelos, from whom we have the Aramaic translation of the Torah, he was a Roman convert to Judaism, and the Rambam has gigantic respect for Onkelos. He writes about him several times in the guide with the greatest of, of honor, the greatest of praise. And in one place where he can't follow what Uncles is doing, he writes to his student, please check the manuscripts you have in your place. Maybe my manuscripts are wrong. Maybe we've got the wrong translation, and then the problem will go away. And if not, he says, God should enlighten me. I don't know what he meant. He does not say that he's wrong. And then mom is not shy. He doesn't like what somebody says. No hesitation in saying that he's wrong. But for Onkelos, he has the highest, the highest regard. And he says, Onkelos, uh, the proselyte, the, the gear, the convert, explained in the true and correct manner by taking Elohim in the sentence, and you shall be like Elohim. This is what the snake said to Chava. And that I'm going to modify as we go on, as you'll see. But the snake said to Chava, you shall be like Elohim. Uncle has translated that, you shall be like rulers. Not like God, but like rulers or princes. Okay? That's just, you should know. The word Elohim has, has three different usages. And in that verse, when the snake says to Ravi, you'll be like Elohim, it means rulers or princes. Having pointed out the homonymity of the term Elohim, we return to the question under consideration. Here's the claim that this critic made, this wise man. It would at first sight, said the objector, appear from Scripture that man was originally intended to be perfectly equal to the rest of the animal creation. Look at the verses that describe man's creation. It looks like he's no better than a dog or a cow. He's the equal of the animal creation. Why? which is not endowed with intellect, reason, or the power of distinguishing between good and evil. Because what does he say to him? Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, meaning you don't have that knowledge. Only eating from the tree gives him that knowledge. So when he's created, he doesn't have the knowledge of good and evil. Then he's like a cow, like a horse. And Adam's disobedience to the command gave him that great perfection, which is unique of man, the power of distinguishing between good and evil, the noblest of all faculties of our nature, the essential characteristic of the human race. It does appear strange that the punishment for rebelliousness should be the means of elevating man to a pinnacle of perfection to which he had not attained previously. This was the subject of the question that he asked, though not the exact words that he used. Okay, now... Think of the verses. It does say he was created, and it is, don't eat from the tree, because that tree gives the knowledge of good and evil, which does imply that he didn't have the knowledge of good and evil. And <coughs> our moral sense of what's right and wrong, what's good and evil, just and unjust, is definitely a key element that distinguishes us from animals. So this objector took it straight and said, it seems that man was created equivalent to the animals, and only by the result of his rebellion does he get this great distinction of being able to know moral concepts and qualities. 
Mark our reply, which was as follows. You appear to have studied the matter superficially. And nevertheless, you imagine that you can understand a book which has been the guide of the past and present generations when you for a moment withdraw from your lusts and appetites, your orgies. For a moment, you withdraw from your orgies and glance over its contents as if you were reading historical work or some poetical composition. Collect your thoughts and examine the matter carefully, for it is not to be understood as you first think, but as you'll find after due deliberation. He's ranking this guy out. He's shoving his face in the mud. Why is he doing that? He calls him wise, learned. In the Hebrew, that the Hebrew translation says chacham. You're a chacham, and, and I'm telling you, you're so addicted to your lusts, to your desires, that you can't read something seriously. You're wise, you're smart, you're educated, and you can't read something seriously because you're addicted to your lusts and appetites. Why does Rome say that? And is he giving us a hint as to who should read his book? Chapter 2. Who should read the rest of the book? Who will be qualified to read the rest of the book? What's the truth? The intellect, which was granted to man as the highest endowment, was bestowed upon him before his disobedience. How do we know that? That's what he said in chapter 1. He said in chapter 1 that man was created in God's tzelem. Tzelem, he says, has nothing to do with pictures. Tzelem has to do with some essential quality, essentially important, defining who you are. And he said that that's the intellect. So when the Torah said that, it was, that man was created with man's tzelem, you're a wise person. You're an educated person. You're a smart person. You should have been able to figure that out. That man had intellect beforehand. And therefore, man couldn't possibly be on, a, on a, a level of the animals and only attain his unique greatness by virtue of disobedience. With reference to this gift, the Bible states that man was created in the Salem of God. Now, second argument. On account of this gift of intellect, man was addressed by God and received his commandments. As it is said, the Lord God commanded Adam for no commandments are given to the brute creation or to those who are devoid of understanding. Notice, says the Rambam, commandments were only given to Adam. No commandments were given to, to animals. Didn't you notice that? You wise, clever, educated person, you didn't notice that? That didn't give you a clue that Adam isn't really on a par with the rest of animal creation? Now, I'm going to go on because it gets quite, quite subtle from that, but what the Rambam is saying to this guy is this. I just showed you two obvious elements in the verses. The verses you're commenting on. The verses you're interpreting and inquiring about. And you missed them. Why? Why? And why did you miss them in this way? That you thought the verses describe Adam as created equivalent to an animal. Can you figure out the answer, what the Rambam is saying? Because you live like an animal. You live like an animal. So you project the way you live on Adam. You can't see the most obvious elements of the verses which say that he wasn't like an animal because you're projecting yourself on him. Wisdom, cleverness, education can't protect you from your prejudices when they touch who you are and what you value. And he's saying to him, as long as you are a prisoner of your desires, and he says this another two times in the, in the, in the guide, word for word, as long as you are a prisoner for, of your desires, you're not going to be able to understand what you read. You won't be able to understand what you read. About 20 years ago, a professor of engineering from Cornell visited the yeshiva. He comes every six months. He used to come at that time every six months to advise IDF on its uh, technological projects for warfare. <coughs> And his sister-in-law was a professor of biology at NYU, was with him. He came into the yeshiva, nobody else was around, so they set up that I should talk to them. I'm talking about prejudices against women. I said, the only explicit statement in the Talmud comparing 
men's and women's intelligence? There's one statement that says that in a particular area of intelligence, women's intelligence is superior to men's. He says, see that? Always putting down women. So I turned to her, and I said, can you repeat the words that I just said? She repeated them correctly. I said to him, look at that. You can't even hear the words I'm speaking. You're so deeply prejudiced, you can't even hear the words I'm speaking. Your sister-in-law, who is the prime one to have troubles with this subject, she heard me fine. She heard what I said fine. But you couldn't even hear it. That's what I'm saying to this guy. If it touches something that you're deeply prejudiced about, you'll make the grossest error, the grossest mistake. You won't be able to read straight. Okay, now the Rambam goes on to explain, however, what is this about this tree that you eat from it and you get the knowledge of good and evil, which indeed Autumn didn't have beforehand, and he didn't have the knowledge of good and evil, so then how did he address him to, uh, to give him a command? Shouldn't, if I address a command, shouldn't the one I address understand that there's a difference between obeying and disobeying, and one is preferable to the other? If you don't have the, uh, the concepts of good and evil, I do that. So the Rambam says that Adam had, before he ate from the tree, the concepts of emes and sheker. And he writes those words in Hebrew in the text, not in Arabic that translated. He writes them in Hebrew. Emes and sheker. Now, emes and sheker don't mean true and false. Emes and sheker don't mean true and false. It's a long story which I will spare you, but the crucial element to notice here is if you will take out a concordance, you know what a concordance is? list of all the words in the Tanakh with every place that they appear. This was done by hand, by a fellow named Mandelkorn, 1890s. And go through every place Emes appears, you'll find that very often Emes is a quality of action. Emes is something you do. You can't do truth. Actions are not true and false. It's a wrong category. And even when applied to speech, <coughs> emes can be applied to the act of speaking. Not to the proposition that's spoken, but to the act of speaking. Now, they are related. Usually, when you speak, the words you speak should be true words. If they aren't, often something's gone wrong. Maybe even something bad has happened. But the word emes refers to the action, not to the words. That's a long, that's a long story. Anyway, the Ramam says that they had the concept of emes and sheka. They didn't have the concept of true and false. Now, and he had it perfectly, completely. Right and wrong, tov and ra, are not applied the way emes and sheka are. Here, the Arabic is difficult, and the translation is very apparent, relative truths, not. Absolute and objective truths. So he gives an example of Emerson and Shekhar. Um, the heavens are spherical. The heavens are spherical. That's Emes. Not good. You wouldn't say it was good. You say it's Emes. It's true. And the earth is flat, he says, is Shekhar. It's false. Everybody knew the earth was round. It's Sheker, but it's not rah, it's not bad. It's Sheker. Now, the function of the intellect is to discriminate between Emes and Sheker. That's its job. A distinction which is applicable to all objects of intellectual perception. When Adam was yet in a state of innocence, was guided solely by reflection and reason. Before he ate. That's why it says you made him little lower than the angels. He was not able to follow or understand the principles of Tov and Ra, apparent, relative truths. An example of which was, he didn't see the need for calls. After he disobeyed, which I'm going to describe in a moment, then he lost that intellectual fa faculty that he possessed. He lost his grasp on Emerson and Shekhar, and then he was wholly absorbed in the study of what is proper and improper, Tov and Ra. The Rambam is, is painting a picture here. Either you have Emerson Shekhar or you have Tov and Ra. You can't have both. You can't have both to the extent that you can't think about them. You can't conceive them. You can't relate to them. Now, 
I don't read the Arabic, and I'm sure I'm missing some nuances, but I'll give you an analogy to what he may mean. <clears throat> Imagine that you meet someone who has never seen a moving picture. Film, video. You say, listen, I have something to show you. Uh, you know, a new experience for you. Take it to a theater. And you make sure the thing is, is, is you know, it's, it's going on. You buy the tickets, you walk in, and just as you come into the theater and see the screen, on the screen you have a picture of a um, herd of, uh, of wild horses stampeding towards the camera. And you hear the pounding of the hoofs and the dust and everything else. And he says, get out of the way, we're going to be dead. We're going to get trampled, they're going to kill us. And you say, no, listen, this dead. don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to be dead. We're going to be dead in two minutes. We're going to be dead. Let's get out of here. <laughs> It's only a film. It's only a film. You who know that it's a film can't take it seriously. Okay, there are um, automatic reactions that you can't control. Maybe your blood pressure goes up also. Maybe your, your, your respiration, but maybe you start to sweat, but you don't leave. You paid for your ticket, and you're going to stay there until the end. <laughs> <laughs> right? He can't hear you. He thinks he's in mortal danger. Right? He can't hear where you're coming from, and you can't experience what he's experiencing, because you know too much. You see it from a much more realistic point of view. Something like that is going on here. MS means that which is ultimately real. Ultimately real, eternal, fixed, God's will, fixed in God's existence. Shekhar means something which is only an illusion. <laughs> something which will naturally fall over, naturally dissipate, <laughs> naturally be lost. That's what Emin and Emerson and Shekhar are. Tov and Ra take very seriously how the events affect people in their own terms. It's bad to hurt people. Why? Because you can't cause pain to people. Period. It's bad to do that. It's wrong to do that. It's wrong to take other people's property. Why? Because it's their property. And since it's their property, they have no business touching it. Because they have rights. And you have no right, you can't trample on their rights. It's wrong to trample on their rights. All of this takes human being as he is, human society as it is, and makes it into an independent reality. And that reality determines what you should and should not do. I, I'm guessing now. It's the best I can do, having read it so many times and spoken about it with many others. If you are rooted in Emerson Shekhar, you're rooted in God's point of view. You're rooted in how it relates to the Creator. If you have a, per a, a perception of how it relates to the Creator, nothing else counts. Nothing else is relevant. Nothing else matters. A person gets hurt or he doesn't get hurt, he loses his property, he doesn't lose his property. So what? So what? I'm looking at it from the point of view of the infinite, eternal creator who's responsible for all existence, who's bringing it to the best possible end. How can what happens to a person be relevant to that? If you are taking, on the contrary, the human reality seriously, if you take the human reality as the thing that determines what's right and wrong, what's good and evil, then you must not be seeing it from God's point of view. You can't be seeing it from God's point of view. Because if you were, you wouldn't take it seriously. You couldn't take it seriously. It would be like taking the moving picture seriously. What happened when they ate from the tree is that they lost the perception of Emerson Shekhar and were reduced to the, the perception of Tov and Ra. That was a gigantic loss. It was a gigantic loss. They no longer could have a grasp of Emerson Shekhar. That's what the Rambam writes. Now, I want to just offer a comment. The Rambam has used MS, uh, MS in, this, in this paragraph in two different ways. On the one hand, he's used it as a sign of the intellect which qualifies one to have commandments. Go back to what I said eight minutes ago. Okay, it's a joke. I don't remember how many minutes it was. Uh, that the MS in the Tanakh is a quality of action. That's one of the reasons why you can't take it. It's just true. Emerson is a quality of action. 
So, if he grasped Emes and Sheker, he could also grasp of actions. Which ones are the actions to be done and which ones are the actions not to be done? Emes applies to that. An action can be Emes. can't be true, but it can be Emes. He also applied Emes to facts, like the heavens are spherical and the earth is not flat. Sounds to me like Emes is a very broad term. It has very broad application. You can apply to facts. You can apply to actions. Indeed, that which is rooted in God's will will be Emes. And everything is rooted ultimately in God's will. So, look what's happened. We still can apply Emes and Shekhar to facts. We're able to do that. We haven't lost that competence. He traded on that competence by giving us the examples of the heavens and the earth. But we've lost the ability to apply it to actions. When it comes to actions, we're hypnotized by the human context. That's what determines for us whether an action is right or wrong. And that's why it's only relative. It's only apparent. Some translations write conventional. It's not essential. When we look at what's good and evil, it's not essential. We can't see actions the way we still see facts. The fact that the heavens are spherical and the earth is not flat, that has nothing to do with us. If there were no people, it would still be that way. It's not relative to us. It's an absolute fact. Some actions are absolute in that sense, but we've lost that. We've lost that ability to understand it. That's what happened. When they ate, they suffered a gigantic demotion, gigantic step down. And that's, that's the truth about uh, the eating of, of, of the tree. Are we together so far? Now, how, does, yeah. how would MS possibly apply to action? So I don't know if I can answer you because that's what we lost. Yeah. Words, the fact that we're, we're fluent in Tovera and we, we think that way naturally, we're, we, we agree on how to make these judgments, means that we've lost that, that connection. Um, A lot of times it's, it's hard to uh, just see an action for what it is. It is an action. There's no connotation. There's no bad or good about that action. It just is. The water flows. That's an action. Whether that's good or bad is how we perceive it to be, correct? Isn't he talking about human action? Yeah, I mean, uh, the water flows is not an action. Water flows is not an action. Even when a human being trips and falls, that's not an action. When a human being, uh, his eyes blink. We don't say he blinks his eyes. Not unless he firstly blinks them. But we say his eyes are blinking. Because he's not doing it. It's happening automatically. Right? Your temperature. You know, there's the autonomic nervous system. Make sure your temperature stays, stays, uh, stays the same. It happens in your body, but you're not doing it. An action is a motion that's caused by a will, a will applied with understanding. Nothing less than that counts as an action. And what I'm saying now, I think, is pretty common in philosophy also. The fact that your body moves doesn't make it an action. Um, and now the question is how to evaluate the actions. How do we evaluate them? If we could see the unfolding of the creation, if we could see where it's going, see how each action fits into the goal that God wants to bring the creation to, if we could see that, so then that would be our, our point of reference. But, we don't, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, like, it's like someone walking into, into um, a, a a doctor's office has seen the doctor poking a person with needles. And it hurts. And the person's saying, yeah, he thinks it's a torture chamber. <laughs> because he's only seeing the surface. He's seeing somebody getting stuck with needles. That's all. He doesn't know that's being injected with a serum which will save his life. He doesn't know that. He can't, he can't appreciate that. So the, the reality is hidden from us, and we're falling back on a relative, superficial picture what we see about the actions is true. People get hurt. They have property. The property is misappropriated and so on and so on. It's all true, but it's like the truth of the movie picture. There is the appearance of a herd of horses bearing down on us. Yes, there, that appearance is really there. But of course, it's only an appearance. It's only an appearance. It's not, it's not real. The horses aren't really there. So... Um, this, I mean, this ties up with what he says in the, about the book of Job and the book of the Sword. At any rate, we've lost that. So to explain what it would mean, um, it would mean seeing that an action is correct the way you see that the heavens are spherical is correct. The heavens are spherical is correct in and of itself. 
You believe it, you don't believe it, you like it, you don't like it, you bet against it, and you're worried. You're going to lose the bet. Sorry, sorry, the heaven's a miracle. Period. That's all. There's nothing else to it. Nothing else to say about it. Yeah, something like that would be the picture of an action. You say, look, this action does it. It works, right? You like it, you don't like it, you promised him, you didn't promise it. <laughs> the action does it. That's all. All the rest of the considerations that all the moralists and the ethicists and the philosophers and all the psychologists take into, into account will be like commenting on the movie instead of commenting on the reality. And it's very hard for us to do that. When somebody does something which we regard to be unjust, we are outraged. When somebody does something that's unjust and then something happens to him and he suffers, we think, good, yes, he deserved to suffer. Look, he did that terrible outrage. We're caught up in the in the Tovara perspective, and that's because we, we, we lost that, uh, that uh, external perspective. Now, the interesting question here is, how did they do it? Okay, after he's he describing the disobedience, the, the breaking of the mitzvah, listen to what it says. When he began to give way to desires which had the source in his imagination and to the gratification of his bodily appetites. Talking about Adam. He gave rise, he gave in to bodily appetites. Hmm. What did we say in the previous page about that wise man who was, was uh, debauched, you know, living with his orgies and couldn't read the psukim correctly? Is that now being applied to Adam also? The first step is he became interested in his bodily desires. As it said, listen carefully, we're talking about Adam. Adam. He gave way to his bodily desires. As it is said, as it says in the verse, and the wife saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to the eyes. Do you hear what the Rambam is doing? The words that are applied in the Torah to the wife, he says, are Adam's words. They describe Adam's state of mind. Anybody who wants to make a distinction and say, no, it's just a woman, and you know how women are. Women are inferior, and they are distracted, and so forth and so on. Adam wouldn't be guilty of that. The Rambam is describing Adam's failure and uses the words that describe her to describe his failure. I want you to know that what Chaim Lutzato does exactly the same thing. But Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the great Kabbalist, the fact that he uses these words to describe his state of mind. So this was a shared state of mind that they both had. The reason the Torah says about her is an interesting question, but it's clear from both of them. And Lutzato follows the Ramba many times, dozens of times. That in itself is a whole story. At any rate, what did he do when he began to give way to desires that had a source in his imagination, the gratification of bodily appetites? He was punished by the loss of the part of the intellectual faculty which he had previously possessed. He lost the grasp of Emerson and Shekhar. And therefore, transgressed the command which had been charged on the score of his reason. He then ate from the tree. In other words, it's a three-step process. The first step was turning towards the body and the bodily desires. That alone caused the loss of the grasp of Emerson Shekhar. Then he ate from the tree and learned Tobara, and that confirmed it. Once you have Tobara, you can't get Emerson Shekhar back. After stage two, he could conceivably have gotten it back. He lost it, it was empty. It was an open block. But now that open block has been filled with Tobara, now he's finished. So it's a very interesting description. Those who are familiar with the Muslim movement and how much they stressed self-control and focus and the spiritual over the physical, this book was written 900 years ago, but it's quite clearly here. And it's several other times in the book explicitly. Anyone who's a prisoner of his bodily desires can't understand my book, can't understand the subject of the book, can't understand what I write. So it's definitely here. So then, then I, and the result of it is knowing good and evil. Now, he says... The eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. The eyes were open. Says the Rambam. What does it mean, opening the eyes? What does opening the eyes refer to? 
Alma says it refers to intellectual grasp. After all, they weren't blind before. They were naked, and they knew very well that they were naked. Right? He says, it, the Torah doesn't write, the eyes were open and they saw that they were naked. It writes, the, the eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. And the word knowledge there is the das, which means an, ex, an understanding of the reality. The das usually refers to experiential knowledge, understanding the reality in depth. And he says that's what it always means. Piku achinayim always means intellectual understanding. And he brings a proof which bothered me for years because I thought the proof that he's bringing says the opposite. When, when Abraham expels Hagar and Ishmael from the house, he says, the with a jug of water, and they wander and they, in, the, in the desert, they lose up the water, and she thinks he's going to die, and she throws him under one of the bushes, and she wanders away, and he's crying. God says to her, I've heard the voice of the child crying, not your voice, his voice. Um, you're not going to die. I have plans for you and him, and I promised you before. And then it says, God opened her eyes, and she saw a well. So I thought to myself, hey, that scene with the retina, with the optic nerve, you know, that scene. How could the Rambam bring this as a proof that this opening of the eyes is an intellectual grasp. I realized, the Rambam, of course, I don't, he doesn't need my confirmation, the Rambam is, of course, 100% right. You know very well, it's happened to everyone in this room, it happens quite often. You're looking for something, and it's right there, you just don't see it. You just don't see it. He says, look, it's right there. So, missed it. There's such a thing as focusing on and, an, and analyzing the scene in front of you. You ask three people to describe what they see, you get often three different, different descriptions. Not that they contradict, but some things will catch one person's uh, attention, other people will catch another person's attention. She saw the scene, her retina was fine, her optic nerve was fine, she wasn't interpreting it correctly. She didn't pick up on the cues in the scene. That's intellectual analysis. He speaks about opening the eyes in the, in the future to see the reality of God and understand the reality of God in the Torah. That's an intellectual understanding. That's not, it's not, it's not vision. The verse that talks about those who have eyes and yet don't see. We're not talking about a neurological problem in the optic center of the brain, which, which cancels uh, uh, visual experience. Talk about the fact that the, the, everything's in front of them and they don't understand it. This is what happened to Adam as a result of the of the uh, of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yes, he acquired the tree of uh, good of knowledge of good and evil, and it is Rambam's view that people are born with the basic knowledge of good and evil. And the way he describes it, I don't think it makes any difference whether you're Jewish or not, or not Jewish. Everyone has a basic understanding of good and evil, and that you have before the Torah commands you anything. To the extent that in the guide, Maimonides says, any mitzvah that's logical and a person performs it, he'll be rewarded even if no prophet commanded it. And every, any prohibition that's logical and a person violates it will be punished even though no prophet commanded it. He says it twice. There are certain things which you your mind is, cre is created in such a way that you know spontaneously. And he quotes a verse, page 19, verse 22. So the English, which is not wrong, reading it sort of more or less the way Rashi reads it, verse 22 in the middle of the, of the, of the page. Shem God said, Behold, man, this is after he ate from the tree, behold, man has become like the unique one among us, comma, knowing good and bad. The Rambam doesn't translate it that way. The Rambam translates like this. Behold, man has become unique, comma, without the among us. Next word in Hebrew is mimenu, knowing from himself good and evil. His knowledge of evil, good and evil comes from himself. The Trump doesn't make that. Yes, the Trump doesn't make it that way, but Unklis translates it that way. 
So someone who's uh, diseased with the modern academic prejudice, oh, the Rome of the philosopher, you know, a medieval Spanish philosopher, so he's going to take it that way. But Uncas wasn't a medieval Spanish philosopher. Uncas was a Roman convert a thousand years before the Rambam. And that's exactly what, the, what Uncas writes. Tozer can read it the middle of the con- column of Uncas. Man has become unique in the world. Knowing good and evil from himself. And the Rome is not alone. I have a dozen references in Gemara, so we've shown him in Achronim, that people know on their own the <coughs> basics of good and evil. So what he what he what happened to him when he ate for the tree was a change in the nature of you of humanity. We're born with this. And the application of Emerson Shekhar to action is lost. And I don't know that he writes that it will ever be recovered. I'm not aware of any place where he writes that it will be recovered. So that's, that's the picture of what happened there. And the, the Musar is the Zagushal. At any rate, the Rambam's uh, work here is work that's comprehensive. And it works on all levels, as, uh, and the great Rosh Hashivas learned it and studied it, and some even quoted it. Hasidic Svarim, Naoz Desha, first Sachach of Rabbi, in his parish on Chumash, quotes the Murad Abuchim, and on the same page he quotes the Zohar. I know two, two great contemporary Rosh Hashiva, one who was lifted a few years ago, one who's still alive, who had a Chavus in the, the Murad Abuchim. Can't say who because I heard from somebody. But, uh, and their attitude was, if Maimonides wrote it, there must be a way of serving God in it. And they wanted to know what that way of serving God is. They wanted to find it, plumb its depths. Uh, it's, an, it's an absolute masterwork. Mm-hmm.